So we're joined today by one of the top thinkers on early modern philosophy. Uh, Andrew Schicknell is a professor at, at Princeton University. Uh, Andrew, you're also, uh, you have a very prestigious sounding title as a president of the North American Kant Society, That's right. which is very uh, <clears throat> impressive to me. Uh, welcome to uh, Blue Scaling and Startup. I should say, thank you. Thanks for having me. I should say former president. I just handed it over to somebody else, but I did it for the last okay. time. And you guys are doing an event, uh, uh, something for the, the anniversary of Kant uh, this month, right? There's like something like that. Yeah. So this is Kant's 300th birthday, 1724, 2024. And there are all these events over the course of the year that the society, uh, the North American Kant Society is involved in and then lots of things across the world. But one of the things we're doing is at Hopkins in March, we're actually sponsoring together with some people at Hopkins, a stage reading of a play by Thomas Bernhardt called Immanuel Kant. So it's this absurdist play recently translated into English from the German. And it kind of makes fun of Kant and philosophers generally, sort of like you know Aristophanes in the clouds. But we're putting it up just to sort of celebrate the birthday. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize it was Kant's <laughs> 300th birthday. So 300, yeah. Okay, uh, you have a course. Your course is on food ethics, and it's available on Coursera uh, for free, right? It's a free course. That's right. It just went up last week. It's free. Features a bunch of interviews and even some on-location efforts to figure out what we should eat and what kind of foodscapes would be ideal going forward. And, and which is a really great example of, you know, applying philosophy to your actual life. Uh, and um, A, there's a, a link to that Coursera course in the description of this um, you know, video or podcast episode or, or LinkedIn event, depending on where people are. Um, and but the the, the URL is coursera.org slash learn slash course uh, food ethics. Uh, but uh, other than that, where uh, obviously people are going to be uh, very taken by your amazing insight uh, th today. So so where after that, where can they um, wh where else can they find you? Uh, I mean, there's my Princeton website. It's chignell.net. And there's um, there's a, a, a thing that I'm building with a colleague called the Princeton Project in Philosophy and Religion. Uh, we're refreshing that website, so that'll be up in a couple of weeks. There's an old one up there now. You, I think you might be linking to that, too. So that's a our effort at an academic startup where we're trying to get people interested in philosophy and religions broadly construed to talk to each other a little bit more and to think about, in particular, what we're calling existential commitments. So this is these are commitments that are kind of pervasive. It's not just a function of a role that you're taking on, like professor or member of a jury or something like that, but something that is sort of there throughout your life, something that is conscious or voluntary. So not just things you're forced into, but you at least at some point get a chance to reflectively think about, and it is in some way under the control of the will. So things like getting married, a career choice, um, having children, that sort of thing. So we're interested in the way in which religions, you know, food choices too. So that relates to the food ethics class. Um, the way in which religions and philosophical movements have advocated for certain kinds of commitments, but also just thinking, especially with our undergraduates, about what it means to make a big choice like that, what the sources of some of the choices might be, whether it's okay to accept what your parents have taught you or what some authority has taught you, what some sacred text has taught you, whether you really need to think through things for yourself, as Kant would say. So that's what we're focused on right now. There's this, uh, so, so since you mentioned it, you, and you're, you're technically a professor of religion or of philosophy? So I have, two, I have a joint PhD in religion and in philosophy, and I've been in philosophy departments uh, at other universities. When I came to Princeton, my primary position is in this thing called the Center for Human Values that was founded in the 80s by Amy Gutman, who's now the ambassador to Germany, I think, but she was okay. the provost at the time with Rockefeller money and the Rockefeller's so the Rockefeller professor. Yeah, that's right. Really cool. Rockefeller professors. Yeah. 
the original idea that they wanted to fund was research into sort of paranormal psychology and really unusual efforts to reach transcendence or something. And Princeton was like, no, but how about something called the Center for Human Values? And then we'll talk about all that stuff as well as some more standard ethical things. So that's my primary appointment. And then I'm also in the religion and philosophy departments. Yeah, yeah there's this story uh, and and I, my family is Jewish, I guess. I, I don't know to what extent I personally identify as Jewish, but um, uh, but so, so I'm not that familiar with the uh, well, the New Testament. But but there's this uh, biblical story of uh, you know Jesus, and you may have heard this. So he's kind of like walking down the road, and then there's a um, uh, I guess a shepherd who uh, comes to see him, and and, and it's the, uh, the Sabbath. And he has a a sheep that's stuck in a ditch, and he's like, "Hey, I'm supposed to not work today, um, but my sheep is going to die if I don't take it out of the the ditch. So what should I do?" And then I think Jesus's answer is something along the lines of, "Like, if you have already mastered the rules, I, I think exactly what it is. It's like." If it essentially, it comes down like if you've already mastered the rules, then you can break them. And if you haven't mastered the rules, then you should follow the rules or something like that. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? And like, yeah, yeah. how does that relate to what you were? It kind of relates to what you were saying. Parable of the lost sheep. Yeah. I mean, it feels like the message there is something like mastering the law is important and that only when you've mastered it, do you know how to make appropriate exceptions, something like that. And so he's yeah. always arguing against the so-called Pharisees who apply the law in this rigid, uh, kind of Kantian way, actually, right. and is a sort of advocate for important exceptions. I think in, I mean, you would know this better, in Jewish law, there are all kinds of exceptions, for instance, to Sabbath keeping, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, well, Jewish stuff, like Old Testament stuff, is essentially just like Babylonian hmm. um, and like Mesopotamian. And, and while the um, the the New Testament to me just feels much more like Roman and Greek and kind of uh, you know European uh, when I read it, uh, I, I don't know. Like you, you'd, I haven't read it much, but uh, so you know better. But my impression is always like it felt much closer to you know Greek philosophy than to kind of like um, like ancient Babylonian stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even and especially as you go along with the later epistles written in Greek by people, some of whom were familiar with the Greek traditions in philosophy, even. And you even see them mentioning like certain Greek philosophers on Mars Hill and definitely don't get as much of that in the Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the Gospels have this sort of middle position where you feel like it's this oral history coming out of something that happened and has a lot of Hebraic elements, but then interpreted through some of these more Hellenic traditions. Yeah, it's interesting. I was never that interested in the Bible um, hmm. until more recently. Uh, I think the, the thing I like most about it is, uh, well, so I was never really interested that much in Greek philosophy, uh, so like ancient Greek philosophy or in the Bible. And I've been much more interested in those two things recently and the two things the thing i like about both is that they're really easy to read hmm. um or at least they're like i don't know how easy they are to read in the original text but in the in, they're, they're people have translated them their available translations are really easy to read um and i i, I value that a lot um because yeah, it I mean, enables you to like, talk to people about it most read book in the world obviously so lots of different translations I grew up uh, pretty religious, and so remember from you know age five reading children's Bibles, cartoon Bibles, all kinds of living texts that were very like colloquial. Yeah, so maybe it's a really good transition into what a uh, 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 like talking about your upbringing, like, and, and I noticed you. So you 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 went to college to a you know very religious um college right yep wheaton college yeah 
And, and what was your, so, so you grew up in, I assume, a very religious family, which is very different for me. Like what, and, and I guess most people at Princeton would have a very different, like I think it's kind of like trendy now to not be religious. So like, <laughs> like, I mean, do, do you feel that's kind of like unique-ish? And then like how, how has that shaped, you know, your perspective versus, you know, other, like your other peers? That's a good question. Yeah, so I was brought up by evangelicals who, but there were a certain kind of evangelical who were a little more focused on religious experience. So they were part of a kind of Jesus hippie movement in California. And, you know, they baptized themselves in the Pacific Ocean. And so it was less about kind of rules and prohibitions and more about experience and relationship with God, that kind of thing. And I think it influenced me in all these ways that are very difficult to fully parse out. But one would just be as a teenager, I started reading books and novels about religion and about the extent to which religions can be rational. And so ended up discovering philosophy. And then by the time I was in college, became a philosophy major. But it was at Wheaton College, which is a place where a lot of people are kind of invested in that tradition. And so a lot of the philosophy we were doing was about, you know, these late night, dark nights of the soul in our dorms. Like, do I believe any of this stuff? Can I keep going with it? What would happen if I gave it all up? I think that's very different from a lot of what my Princeton students are experiencing right now. But it led me into the profession that I'm in. I do think um, there are still quite a few students with that kind of an upbringing. And in this course that we're teaching right now on philosophy, religion, and existential commitments, we see a lot of them wondering the same sorts of things. And in particular, wondering things like, can I take a text like the New Testament to be authoritative and direct me in my existential commitments? Or do I need to, like Kant says, or Descartes says, you know, sit down and think through it all for myself? Is that like the real sign of autonomy? So I think there's quite a few students at all of these universities that have the same kind of upbringing, whether it be in the Jewish, Muslim, uh, you know, more Buddhist context or Christian evangelical Catholic thinking about it, but doing so in a somewhat quieter way because the broader context isn't full of all those religious trappings. Oh, interesting. And then so then you um, and I want to because we have so much to talk about and yeah. at the same time, your uh, you know, audience doesn't know you that well. So, so, <laughs> so I want so, so maybe we can fast forward to um, like if you give us the most important things that brought you to Princeton as a as a philosophy prof like what, what would you say are like the two biggest moments that you know influence you to to getting to where you are uh, so in graduate school I did that joint degree in religion and philosophy thinking about some of these issues I realized that Kant was this kind of Mount Everest that I felt like I wanted to scale. So when you look at this 850 page book from 1781 and think this is somehow really important, it's like the third most important philosopher in the Western tradition, but it seems extremely difficult and it is. And so, you know, some people are just repelled and other, others for whatever pathological reason are like, I must scale this mountain. And so that was me. And I just kept going and wrote a dissertation on kind of Kant's theory of faith. So he thinks that faith that can be rational under certain circumstances. Um, and then got a job at Cornell and kept going with that and added some other interest. And ultimately, after getting tenure, you sort of have a crisis of relevance. So it's like, well, I'm writing these journal articles that seven people read. And it's this beautiful right. Byzantine baroque process of you know doing these delicate things and it's it's wonderful but it really is fairly low impact and so a lot of people then start looking for other things to add to the dossier and at that time my best friend who's also a philosophy professor became vegan sort of out of the blue and we were going on for a while and then he finally said something which which in a way is a bit controversial he was like look i don't know if i can continue to be your friend if you don't at least look at the arguments so he wasn't like, you have to convert to veganism if I'm going to still be your friend. But, you know, he's like, I, I think of this as an extremely important moral issue. 
And it's hard for me to be deep friends, deep Aristotelian friends, which is what we like to say at the time, um, with somebody who's not even looking at the art. So then I just decided to force myself to look at them by teaching them. The only way to really, really understand something is to force yourself to teach it. And so I started teaching this class with a colleague called Food Ethics at Cornell. And it grew and became a bigger deal. And then it became a research interest. And I've edited a book on it and then did this Coursera class. And I think it was that plus um, the other thing that I kind of added in terms of my interests, which is a focus on despair and hope and what those are and how, how they motivate us or block us from accomplishing our various goals, both individually and collectively. It's a Kantian theme. Kant says the third most important question in philosophy is what may we hope? So I sort of started from him and then got interested in it in a more in a broader fashion. And I think Princeton liked this combination of, you know, the scholarly stuff plus the applied food stuff and then the hope and despair and ended up bringing me in a couple of years ago. I, uh, you know, the thing that stood out when we spoke last time was uh -huh how focused you are at least at this moment in your life on making philosophy relevant to people who don't know anything about philosophy um so like when we were talking about sean kelly yeah. uh and for the listeners uh we have another episode with sean kelly um uh that's uh so if you just look up let's scaling sean kelly you can find it um so Sean Kelly taught at Princeton, and Andrew, I don't think you know him, but you know no, him. I know him, yeah, but we didn't oh, know him. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I met him a couple and, times. And you were saying, like, your immediate reaction to him was like, yeah, like the stuff that he studies is like so applicable and and, and speaks to uh, regular people. Like that was your reaction? I thought that was uh, such a, you know, like, like very unique, like it's not what... I, like the other, like Sean Kelly doesn't think about it that way. For example, like <laughs> I don't know any philosophy profs that focus on kind of evangelizing the philosophy to uh, philosophy to everybody. So, uh, well, you interviewed really him right after me. right after that New York Times piece on Christmas that came out. You you interviewed him, right? So yeah, he's obviously got some interest in public yeah philosophy. Yeah, and he's, I mean, he's been very, I think he's now, um, he's doing a, uh, he's heading up one, like the reviews of whether they should rename one of the buildings at Harvard. Right. So he definitely does that. But he's like, like, for you, it seems to be like, like, like so re really important and something that, and, and even like, you know, you, this like food ethics thing, like it feels so useful to people and this, this, um, uh you know center that you're starting is all about that like what what brought you to caring about that um i assume you didn't like people don't go into philosophy because they care about making a broad impact on uh, on everybody in society so like when when did that become a priority I mean, I'm glad it seems like that. I actually feel like other people are doing so much more and so much better than I am in philosophy. Um, you know, there are people writing very accessible books and people like Sean writing in, in public venues. So I feel like I just dip my toe in. But um, I guess I have felt, as I said, there's this crisis of relevance that comes after about 10 years of doing something that's fairly obscure for your average person. And, you know, realizing that no one in my family had ever even read or understood anything I was working on um, and finding both the joy. I imagine physicists are like this and, you know, lots of very technical skills lead you to both the joy of it and also the questions about what it does for a broader world. Um, so I tried to just add things where I could on the side that would be potentially useful to to outside people. And I think I like to start with undergraduates. I mean, that's really the vocation, right, is to interact with them. And even at these, I mean, at these research universities, we're not trained to focus on undergraduates. And we're told, I mean, I remember being told, if you win a teaching award before you get tenure, that's the best sign that you're not going to get tenure. <laughs> um, so the thought is you're wasting too much time on undergraduates. I don't really see it that way. I think that uh, the the little things we do, the books and articles are are fun for us and important in a certain way, but that these are the people, especially at places like Cornell, where I was, and Penn, and uh, Princeton, 
the undergraduates are the people who are going to go out and have all of these other sorts of nexus effect impacts. And so to the privilege of having them for one semester or two semesters with you and, you know, interacting with them and making the scholarly stuff seem at least accessible to them at some level is really valuable. And so I've just been kind of focused on them and then occasionally to a broader, a broader audience. I always, so like I, I spent like a few weeks several years ago thinking about what, so something like relate to this is like my thinking was, I think where I, where I ended up was the thing that matters to me most is immortality wow. and what, like the way that I can actually practically like become immortal <laughs> is one by having children, right? You kind of like genetically and, and you kind of program them to become mini yous, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so that's like one one way. And, and yeah. by the way, uh, you just had your first kid, I think. Yeah, exactly. Four weeks ago today. Yeah, yeah. this must be so. super exciting. You're now immortal. So, right. Um, I mean, yeah. I I haven't heard the parenting philosophy programming them to become little me's, but I, but I like it. But so, so I was like thinking, like you know, so the the two ways you become immortal is either you know by having children and kind of you know propagating yourself genetically, and you know uh, through the. I have a very similar personality, my father, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, this is a, a kind of a, a, a philosophical question people have asked forever. It's like, am I actually the same me as when I was five years old? Because, like, what's actually similar? Um, and, like, in a way, you know, I am more my father than my father himself is my father from when he was younger. And, and, and this whole thing. But, but essentially, it's kind of like, that's one way you can gain, you know, effective immortality. And then the yeah. other way you can gain effective immortality is by teaching others. Um, so like we work, I work with a lot of young people, like students and recent grads, and they really do, like some of them, they're really eager. Like they take your personality and you see them over, over years, like over like 10 years, like they'll essentially become very, like very similar to you. Um, That's true if they really look up to you and they're like, oh yeah, this is the type of person I want to become. And in, in effect, you know, that you're, you know, reaching some form of immortality. So that, that was my, uh, my thought process. Just like the reason I care about mentoring young people and, you know, having children is, is actually totally selfish. It's just, I want to be immortal. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, um, of course, Shakespeare says that the way to do it is by writing sonnets. Yeah. Or but I'm not so sure that's as true anymore. I mean, I think, you know, you can write a book that if you're lucky sells 10 or 50,000 copies. But I think what you're doing is actually probably far more impactful, if that's the word we want to use, um, over time, just because of the numbers of people it reaches. But there is a kind of density of interaction that teaching gives you. So it's one thing to, you know, do a podcast like this and a few people, maybe a lot of people hear our voices once and a few ideas maybe, but the the beauty of university college education is the four years and the full community and all the experiences they're having on the side, but then also this intensive work environment with us. Um, and I do think that, uh, you know, immortality, I don't know, but certainly a kind of long-term effect can be had. There's nothing more rewarding than having like an alum. I've been teaching now for 20 years, hard to believe, and but having alums come back from 10 years ago or something and say that they still remembered the course or even kind of shaped their life around some of the things we were discussing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, or immortal immortality is kind of a grandiose word, uh, yeah. but... Um, uh, but uh, I think it kind of gets a point across. Um, yeah, the, the other thing I think that, that, that might be really interesting for entrepreneurs is, so I had exactly the same experience as you were describing uh, about doing things that nobody cares about or understands. Mm -hmm. So I built two businesses. Right. They're both successful, but they're like, you know, hardcore, like B2B SaaS like enterprise companies yeah. and like i don't think even my mother knows what those businesses did <laughs> right. i really don't like she tried to understand but like i don't think she ever really knew 
And it's not just that she didn't know, she didn't care. She mm. just, like, she wanted to care, but it's just like her eyes would glaze over the minute yeah. you talk about it because it's yeah. so enterprisey. And it, it affects nobody, right? It's like some IT director or some a chief revenue officer. Like, like, it's just, you actually totally irrelevant. While if you're Mark Zuckerberg, let's say, or the founder of WhatsApp or Instagram, you, you've impacted in. so many yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like, re I mean, I mean, I know you have a background in philosophy, but like Reed Hoffman could have continued his work in philosophy. And in some sense he has, right? But in this much more um, sort of outward facing way that has changed a lot of people's lives. I have to admit that I do admire that. I mean, he's still writing papers about Adam Smith and the virtues and the vices and doing that in a way that is digestible to a, a lot of people. Um, I do think philosophers and act, people in the humanities generally are trying harder to be digestible. Uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, there's a lot of incentives that have been put in place and, and threats. I mean, I think people are like, the humanities is going to die unless we make the case for why we need to stick around. Um, and so people are trying, but it's a hard skill and it's like teaching. It's not something we're really trained to do when we write a dissertation. Um, and yeah, so well, I and, people who can do it. Well, one of the challenges about one of the problems with restricting things, only things you can explain clearly to a lot of people. Yeah, is that you can only talk about things you actually understand very deeply. Right. And the things that you understand very deeply are usually not that novel, right? Like if you make a huge, like say Heidegger's, like the, the extreme example that's like, I have no idea. I can't read Heidegger. <laughs> um, I, uh, Sean has helped me a lot to understand yeah. it. But like, I, I it's like one of the philosophers are like, if I read it, like I can spend like a day staring at a page. I still don't understand what he's talking yeah. about. That's that Mount it's Everest like, feeling. Yeah. But it's like, it's just like, and what it is, it's like he's expressing concepts and ideas are so novel and so kind of like pushing the boundaries of knowledge yeah. that, you know, it took hundred years afterwards almost for people to say what he was saying in a way that was clear. Yeah. Um, so yes. you, by only limiting yourself to things you can say clearly, you're actually eliminating like huge, you know, leaps forward in a certain way. I don't know. Yeah, that's, 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 that's actually a really important caveat. So, I mean, there is this huge effort now to, to write publicly and to write for people for a broader audience. Um, but I think it's important to recognize exactly what you're saying, which is that some of this stuff is extremely just essentially difficult and complicated. And, you know, it's, it would be weird to insist that the physicists do all of their work in such a way that everybody could digest it, right? So there still has to be a place for um, philosophical work that's just going to be for the specialists. And then hopefully there are people who come along and take the very best things, and maybe it does take 100 years, or in Kant's case, 300 years, to figure out, you know, what are the thing, what are the main moves here, the, the big contours of this position that could be useful to a broader group of people. So, okay, you're doing this project on crypto. Oh, yeah. And so I want you, like, the big question I want to discuss is this core Kantian, you know, precept, which is like, ought implies can. Right. And um, so maybe the right, and, and what I want to do is like, challenge whether that actually makes sense or like try to understand that concept by trying to apply it to the to crypto which is something that that you are working on um so maybe the right starting point would be you know tell us what does ought implies can mean um yeah so what, what, what does that mean and like why is it such an like impactful you know kantian um uh concept yeah, so Kant is probably the most famous defender of this principle. Other philosophers have articulated. I think it's an intuitive thought at some level. But if what we're talking about is the moral ought, you ought to do this, then it becomes very hard to see how you 
could accept that moral claim if you didn't literally didn't think you can do this. And we see that in the form of excuses. So when somebody says um, you ought to buy locate just to choose like a completely impossible thing, at least at the moment, um, you ought to be both there in person with Julian in um, where were you again? Bangkok. Bangkok, right? Yeah, um, Last hard time to you were follow in, for the next couple right, of months. In Bangkok and here in Princeton about to go teach your class, right? I, it, I, maybe there's a sense in which I ought to, that would be good. It'd be better to be speaking with you in person, obviously. Um, but I can't. I mean, it's just obvious that I can't at, on this day be in both places. And so we end up saying, you know, it's not the case that I ought to do that. Even though it would be good, I, it's not the case that I ought to. So that's just the kind of common excuse level version of the principle. And I think Kant takes it very seriously that some moral principles that look very, very demanding can't be part of the genuine moral ought, just because it looks like given our finite constraints, we can't get there. He does flip that in, in a very famous argument though, to go back to immortality and say, we think morality does say that we ought to be perfect. Like what would be better than being perfect? You know, that's that's gotta be the demand. Morality does have that demand. But to become perfect means to, let's say, do as many good acts as someone who has only done good acts. And so the only way, given that I've done a bunch of bad acts already, the only way I could ever become perfect, that is have a one-to-one -one function between all my good acts and the good acts of Buddha or Jesus Christ or something, is to live long enough to do as many good acts as they do. And so like, there's a sense in which the only way I can asymptotically get there is to live forever. So Kant actually uses ought implies can as the and the, the commitment to the fact that we ought to become morally perfect to defend the idea that there must be an afterlife and the immortality of the soul. A lot of people don't love that argument, but you can see how ought implies can either can excuse you from the ought or it can take you from the ought into something that looks like a fairly speculative claim. And so, so for Kant, it's kind of like what matters is to be moral, like you sh should be moral. And then right. the, if you can, if if you can like like if something is the moral thing then that tells you that it is a thing that you can do so so for example it's like uh like an example that we discussed earlier it's like if i should not lie like, like i'm late and i shouldn't lie about the fact that i'm that actually i was not like i shouldn't say like i was stuck in traffic i should just say like you know, I was just too lazy or I got lost or whatever. Um, like, I shouldn't lie. And that means there is a way for me to not lie, even though maybe it seems like I need to lie because it'll kind of ruin this, this relationship I have or whatever it is. Actually, there is a way to find, um, you know, a path forward. So like, so, so, uh, like that's you, yeah. an, an example of that. Right. So and, like and then the... Yeah, the moral claim, if you're really clear that I ought not to lie, and Kant thinks there's no exceptions to that rule, then it must be the case that I can. And then people bringing up excuses like, well, it's a very difficult situation, or, oh, my background in education makes it difficult for me to follow those rules, end up looking like excuses that aren't valid to Kant. And he has this example like, put a gallows on the front yard of somebody's house, and then ask them whether you know they can cease from doing this thing that they say they can't stop doing. And it looks like the answer might be different. So with the right kind of incentive or threat, we can do a lot of things that we sort of think, oh, I can't do that. So, so okay, so, right. And then you're doing some crypto stuff. So you're actually pretty familiar with the space. And I think the argument of people in crypto is things ought to be decentralized, right? So let's say there should not be kind of a centralized social network that's owned by Twitter and Facebook. There should be, uh, like there ought to be a decentralized network that's kind of like owned by the community. And then if ought implies can, 
then what you would believe is, well, therefore there can be, but, but it does seem that there are a lot of people who have tried to do this in the last couple of years and they couldn't. Yeah. So how would you kind of like reconcile those two facts or those two elements? And like, what does that teach us about crypto, about entrepreneurship and about Kant? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So you're right that I'm on the steering committee for this new Princeton initiative called the, it's got this long name, the Princeton Center for the Decentralization of Power via the Blockchain. And it's just a couple years old and we've had some conferences and we're trying to get connections with industry and um, do it's things. It's called the on D Center. That. It's called the D Center for sure. Yeah, because that's a really long name. <laughs> the Center for Decentralization, the D Center. Um, but we're trying to see what um, academic sectors can do for the industry as it starts to build out in new ways. And um, one of the things we've we've thought about is the way in which um, a feeling of moral obligation, so the ought might lead people to focus on developing certain projects or products <clears throat> that don't look possible from here and how, I mean, I guess the thought would be, there are some cases where it's just obvious that you can. So the gallows example, obviously I don't need to lie. And so I can refrain from lying. Um, building a perfectly encrypted system in a trustless way, decentralized, that looks like it's sort of up for grabs. And we're not so good at seeing exactly what's possible in that case. So there I think the moral injunction that we ought to looks a little bit more like we ought to try <clears throat> just because I think we can't assume that what's what it feels like we ought to do is possible but it's still the ought directs our attention it focuses our hope it causes us to look for possible pathways when we see the pathways we take them or experiment with them so the moral ought still directs us towards the possible or helps us make things possible in ways that if it weren't there, we might not bother. Yeah, one of the things I find so interesting about looking at concepts like this in real life is that you can then like see the ways in which it ends up being true mechanically that ought implies can. So, mm -hmm. so let's say, um, actually in the original, so blitzscaling was originally a course at Stanford. Right. And one of the uh, classes uh, is taught by John Lilly, who is the founder of Mozilla. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, the whole class is about how successful startups feel like a movement, like a social movement. Hmm. And in a way, and, and that's true for almost all startups. Um, like it really is like you get like, like essentially what you're doing is you're kind of like creating this, you know, story where the protagonist is the users and they're kind of like accomplishing something. It's like a, a social movement of all these users who are accomplishing something for themselves yeah. through your startup. Like that's kind of like how a successful startup hmm. feels. And, um, you know, really underlying that is the concept that there are all these people who believe that what you're building ought to exist. And so it's kind of like, if it's necessary for a startup to feel like a social movement, hmm. then the only way that you can build a startup of, of any type is a startup that ought to exist, or at least that the, the users believe ought to exist. Um, which I find such like, a, a, a like, like it's such an interesting kind of like mechanical description of yeah. um, of that that concept. Yeah, things get really complicated when you move to collective or corporate psychology. So, <clears throat> what is what is the collective here? What is the relevant social group? What kind of obligations does that group have that the individuals might not have? That in itself gets a little complicated. But then to think about what's possible for a social group that wouldn't be possible for any individual within the social group is also really interesting. I mean, surely this is often the way we end up making a difference. 
So we're not, I mean, my undergraduates are really focused on, you know, I want to live a life that makes a difference. Mm, and it is yeah, true. They're trendy have, now. Yeah, you have the individual, the founder in your world, I think, um, who has this idea and ends up getting this thing that really goes and changes the world. But I think for a lot of people, especially when we're thinking about, you know, how do you improve things morally? There is a kind of serendipity where something you do could actually have a large scale effect. But in these gigantic systems where collective action and collective agency is required, it almost always involves basically like getting other people involved and somehow bringing what's possible into being with a much larger group of people. I don't think I don't think we like to hear that because we like to think of ourselves as these like strong agent individuals who are charging through the world making gigantic changes. But realistically, so much of what we're going to do is going to have to have this collective future. Yeah, you're about like I mean you're a bit older than me, but you're uh, you know in my age group ish. So you you yeah. you'd be really familiar with Star Wars, which some yeah, yeah. Uh, your students would not be familiar with. Uh, it's so weird to discover this. Um, I'm sorry yeah, to discover the cultural references are no longer relevant. Yeah, I mean, it's really, if I mention the Matrix, which used to be my go-to for thinking about skepticism and stuff, they're just like, what are my parents like? Yeah. That? I can't remember. So, yeah. yeah, and it's like, the other one that gets me is people who've never heard of Blackberries. Oh, yeah. Because um, that was like such a foundational product for me. Um, but anyway, so, so then, yeah. Right. So, so there, there's this woman called Nancy Duarte who we interviewed two days ago, and okay. she she's um, a very famous you know presentation person. So she like mm -hmm. made um, uh, essentially she's like does all the stuff for Apple and then for uh -huh. a lot of other uh, you know companies. She did like Al Gore's presentation on climate change. She just oh, wow. runs a business for them. But she has a story or this analogy that she uses for startups uh, where Essentially, it's Star Wars. And in the startup, you as the founder, you're not Luke. So most founders think of themselves as Luke, hmm. which is kind of what you're saying. Right. But actually, you're not Luke. You're Obi-Wan Kenobi or you're, um, you're Yoda. And um, Luke is your customer. Really? Okay. So that, that's kind of how she, like a, a analogy she uses um, for startups and for presentations and for everything else. So like in the, um, like if you're pitching an investor, the investor is Luke. If you are, uh, you know, doing a presentation from a big group of people, the, the, the audience is Luke and you are Obi-Wan Kenobi. So the idea is Luke is really the one charging through the world making a difference, but sometimes needs advice and guidance yeah. from the Yoda or the Obi-Wan. And right. that's what the the founder does. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not the like usual mentor. That's not the usual men metaphor, but it actually might be more helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So like if you want to <laughs> accomplish big things essentially, right? Like as you say, you need others to do them for you. Yeah. And how can you get others to do things for you? Well you can't. But what you can do is get them to do things for themselves by kind of like mentoring them and coaching them and giving them the tools that they need to accomplish the thing that they they want to do. Hmm. And uh, so I thought it was a really good, uh, interesting metaphor and kind of illustrates what, what you were saying. Yeah, and, like, and relates to our talk about teaching earlier. Um, I, I don't think yeah. I should maybe consider myself an Obi-Wan figure for from some of my students and see if my teaching gets better. We'll see. Well, her, her analogy actually goes pretty far. So it goes like, so there's, um, so when you're, so you have like Obi-Wan and Yoda and then Luke gets two things. So he gets a kind of a lightsaber that enables him to tackle the kind of like physical obstacles and mm -hmm. he gets the force, which enables him like tackle the psychological obstacles. Um, so, right. And those are the two things that you know Luke needs. Um, to and get that's what the his hero's journey. That's what the founder gives them. Yeah. Yeah. How so as a founder, mean? like, yeah. so, so let's say like you'd create a let's say you're you're creating a new startup where you're helping hmm. private equity firms, um, you know, better due diligence on companies. And it's like, hmm. okay, well, you have the private equity analyst 
Mm -hmm. and he needs, you know, framework to understand how to do due diligence and you're giving him that framework. And then he also needs the tools mm -hmm. to do his due diligence and you're giving him this fancy large language model based tool to do his due diligence. And, but it's really all about him and you're kind of like uh, evangelizing for him uh, rather than, you know, you being at the center of the story. That's interesting because like in the blitz scaling book and in some of your conversations, like with Chris, for instance, Chris, Yeh, um, he seems to think that the founder stays, hovers pretty far above a lot of the people in the organization and that human beings even kind of want to have this leader figure who's a little bit off and removed, a kind of celebrity-esque uh, wizard. And that a lot of direct connection would actually start to undermine that sense of the founder being off. And yeah. Us. I guess Obi-Wan does have that, that vibe where he just appears elusively at the right moment. It gives yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, and then he dies and he comes back even right. more powerful because he's dead. Exactly. But that feels no a little different there. from the teacher who's like really down there with you in the trenches. Like, let me read a draft of your paper. Let me give you feedback. Yeah. Let me give you another draft. So maybe that's a difference between being the exemplar founder and being the teacher who's a little bit more, I don't know, on the ground. Yeah. Hmm. So you had this. Um, so, 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 okay. So, when you apply the uh, like in your work doing crypto, have there been other you know philosophical concepts that have come up and that kind of like came to you, or you're like, oh, here's some some insight from you know famous philosophers that seemed applicable to the crypto space. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, one one of the things we've been working on recently is the question about deep fakes and whether there's some kind of a block chain solution that could serve as a watermark, at least with respect to where you are at a certain time so that this video appears and depicts you as being in Bangkok, when you're actually in New Jersey, you can say like, "Lo, look at my blockchain. The public part of it shows that I was in New Jersey at that time. So that was something we worked on last semester with some people from industry as well as some academics. And I guess the, the question of epistemic backstops kept coming up. So like, what do we do in a context where um, video is no longer going to play the role of like, well, you're saying this thing, but here's a video saying that you're doing this. You say you weren't vaping and um, making out with your companion in the theater. This is Lauren Bobart. Um, but here's a video that shows that you were doing that. And then she gets embarrassed and has to apologize. And her donors are threatening to not help her get elected and so forth. So it looks like video plays the role of epistemic backstop for us right now. But with the deep fakes coming, very soon, probably even in this election cycle, we'll see the candidates doing and appearing to do all sorts of things that they in fact didn't do. So what can play the role of epistemic backstop? And that just then leads to kind of deeper philosophical questions about what is the foundation of knowledge? Do we have to do like Descartes and doubt everything and try to get back to some Archimedean point where, you know, at least I'm certain that I'm thinking and if I'm thinking then I exist and how far yeah. can it really take us? So there are these great epistemological questions coming up in the blockchain and in the sort of AI spaces that connect to old philosophical problems and also bring out potentially new threats and new solutions. Yeah, I'm really curious. Do you know, like, because that's such an interesting piece of insight, because like let's say pre-photography, and yeah. photography has been around since the 1850s, stuff like that, but, but it wasn't like that common, right? No, so yeah. it's very expensive, yeah. Yeah, so let's say like you've had, you know, common usage photography for a hundred years. So like before that, how did anybody know that anything was true? Like, right, like let's say, like, if you say like your wife was cheating on you, I have a photo or I have a video, but, if you're like, what, what, how, how did they do it? It was just like, 
people's word or how 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 was that done yeah i mean i assume testimony played a really important role i mean still we are very credulous we take what people say at face value we assume they're telling the truth unless there are reasons to worry about it but i suppose we have more or we had until recently more epistemic options like recordings machines basically that would help yeah. us sort of verify what people were telling us. There's a lot of work in the history of philosophy on the epistemic value of testimony just because that was so important to them. So they're thinking about scriptures to go back to our original conversation. And, you know, can we think that what these people told us about what happened 2000 years ago and what some guy said on some hill about this or that is vertical? So they're worried about that kind of biblical issue, but also just the fact that you can't get any real certainty out of testimony, especially if you can't verify the reliability of the testifier. So there's really sophisticated stuff on testimony that's more in the history of philosophy and might have to come back a little bit now if we're losing the machines that can really um, certify certain kinds of claims for us. I mean, whether the blockchain can step in and be the new machine that helps us is, I suppose, something that people are still trying to work on. Yeah, I mean, that is like a, a really important thing. And and now that I think back, like, let's say when I was reading Descartes, yeah. it never occurred to me. And, and there, there's so many things in philosophy about, you know, how do you know anything? Right. And like, for me, you know, when I started reading this stuff, let's say 20 years ago, it didn't feel that important. But mm -hmm. I can see how if you have no video, you have no writing, like real writing or rec records of anything. Um, yeah. uh, uh, like, I mean, they had writing, but it was like, you know, it wasn't like filed away in a competent way. It wasn't like stored on a computer. Um, you know, everything could be faked. Uh, like all signatures can be faked. Yeah. Um, actually in Taiwan, they it, when you sign stuff, you actually don't sign. You have a a um, stamp. stamp yeah yeah germany yeah, too right? did some of that yeah oh really okay yeah so they yeah, i think like, you sign and stamp if, if it's something okay. serious you need your stempel you know. but yeah so they they have like a stamp so let's say uh my wife if she needs something get to get signed she just has her stamp that she gives to her parents right. and they can stamp it for her oh right okay so you can um she, give it to somebody else wow i don't know if you're supposed to but that's what she does because she's not okay. in taiwan so yeah. um yeah, it's a really strange, um, strange thing. But you can see how like nothing is real. Like, was this actually signed? Right. Who knows, right? And we might be going back, as you say, to a world that's more, more like that, where it's like, yeah, where it's like actually not because like, everything will become fakeable or more right. fakeable. Like, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So this idea that. I mean, one of the great virtues of the blockchain is supposed to be its trustlessness, right? There's no, there's no what way to back up to a previous epoch or whatever, and or if there is, it would take a lot of computing power and um, very, very unlikely scenarios. And so it looks like something. I mean, it's weird because we talk about trustlessness, but then what we're really looking for is something that we can absolutely trust. And so the thought is, again, looking for the Archimedean point, the absolute certainty that something like testimony or a stamp or people um, writing scriptures down doesn't give us, but that allows us to allows us to trust because there's a kind of certainty involved. I guess the big question for philosophers is, where is trust warranted in the absence of certainty? So yeah, let's admit certainty is great if everything was like math then that'd be fantastic, um, but it's not. And so what do we do in those contexts? And how do we think about rational trust as opposed to rational suspicion? And I, it feels like the blockchain is trying to intervene in this very practical way into these really important theoretical questions. So we're right on time. And do you have an additional five minutes? There's one question sure. I want to ask you, but I don't know if you have to jump. Yeah, sure. No, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, so so the because this is something I know that you have some thoughts on, which is around fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, 
And I thought your perspective on this was so interesting. So maybe, uh, like, so, so my my perspective on fake it till you make it is that you should not do that. Um, but you were saying that uh, you, you know at least some of the some philosophical schools, not Kant. Um, uh, I think Kant would be like it's too uh, too too inly retentive uh, for this. But like the I think the, the pragmatist school right. would be like super pro fake it till you make it. Yeah. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, it kind of starts with Pascal. So speaking of math and cryptography and so forth, um, back in the 17th century, I mean, he's thinking, look, it looks as though if God, if God exists, we can't prove it, but if God exists and you believe in God, that's going to be a much better result than if God exists and you don't believe in God because hell and so forth. And so if God doesn't exist and you still believe in God, it looks like you're still going to have a pretty good life. And yeah, you're making that one big mistake, but what's the cost really? Um, and so we should try to believe in God. And, uh, you know, that's the wager argument. But what's really interesting is what he says. I mean, that is really interesting. But then he goes on to say, OK, suppose the wager is right. What do we do? And he says, belief isn't something you can just manufacture in yourself. Like, I would love to believe that I had a million dollars right here, but I can't. I just can't. You know, you do, I'd love to believe that a loving personal God exists, but I can't. And so what do you do? You um, in the God case anyway, I mean, it'd be a little harder with something empirical like the dollars because it's just so obviously very falsifiable. But with the God case, conveniently, there's like no disproof either. And so what you do is in his case, you go to mass and you take holy water and you say the prayers and you kind of become this figure who's saying, I don't believe, but I want to believe. So I'll act this way and hopefully I'll get to believe. The pragmatists pick that up without so much of the interest in the, the God stuff. I mean, that is there for William James and others. But the thought is just there are these important cases where waiting until we get perfect certainty is just pointless because we're never going to get there. Um, James at one point says, this demand that we wait for absolute certainty or trustlessness is one of the queerest idols ever manufactured in the philosophical cave. It's a good quotation. Um, you can't sometimes wait if the abyss is opening up in front of you and the storm is coming to be certain that you're going to make it. You just have to jump. And so in that case, it looks like getting yourself into the belief that you're going to make it could be very profitable and productive. And so then again, these technologies of the self, like how do we produce these beliefs in us when we don't have evidence that they're true? And I find that, you know, really interesting, both in the religious context, but also in the context of what I was calling existential commitments. Um, you're going to marry somebody or like I just had a kid a month ago with my partner. And these are things that we can't be certain are going to work out well. There's just no evidence there or there, you know, we can't get the evidence right now. And so there is a kind of value, I think, to not updating constantly on little bits of evidence that come in like, oh, it looks like maybe maybe my partner is not as into me right now or maybe this parenting thing's not going. So it, I mean, that might be evidence, but it's sometimes good to learn techniques of the self that allow you to sideline that stuff and continue with this long term commitment just because the ultimate rewards there can be so valuable. You don't get the rewards if you're constantly moved by little bits of counter evidence. So there yeah, are so cases where fake it to make it can seem valuable, I think. So it'd be something like, uh, let's say you're an 18 year old entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Obviously, I mean, I've been 18 um, and I, I, I'm young enough to remember what it was like when I was 18 and I really didn't know anything. Like I sucked and I worked in a political party. I had like a full-time job working in a political party and, uh, I was really lucky cause I was, you know, tall and had a beard. Um, so people <laughs> assumed I was like 25. Yeah. Um, and I just strut around as if I belonged there, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, by the time, I was 25. I was chief operating officer of, the, of that political party. Um, and a big part of that is just like, I essentially, you know, I was like, I'm the best. And I was just, yeah, I'm just the best. I know what I'm doing. I didn't know what I was doing at all. Right. Mm. But like this kind of like just assumption that you like, like if you convince yourself 
that you know everything in a way that does kind of like create the world like, like, like the world kind of like creates itself in your self image in, in, in a certain way like i think that's that's what your your that's kind of like what the argument is is that is that yeah, right but, or there yeah but the way you put it so i was giving like the good cases but the way you put it of course brings out the huge risks and that is the kind of stuff that Kant would feel like is self-deceptive or a lie, even an inner lie, um, as well as deceptive to others. Um, so like the Elizabeth Holmes case, you know, somebody who's got the hustle and has the ambition and, you know, does the thing, drops out of Stanford and goes on to found a company and so forth, but really weirdly starts to believe the, I mean, Maybe she's faking it, or maybe she stopped realizing she was faking it. But in any case, ends up damaging herself in, in immense ways, as well as lots of investors and other people. So surely there has to be some constraints on fake it to make it, where just the hustle and the projection cannot be sufficient. Weirdly, human beings are very susceptible to confidence whether it's earned confidence or unearned confidence. And so you at 18, looking like you're 25, striding around owning the room, probably could get pretty far because of, I don't know, some primordial thing we have as animals to follow the leader if the leader looks like they know what they're doing. So that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah that's it. And I think, so, so like, like the, 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 the counter case that I, I was telling you about isn't original to me. It comes from um, this guy, Tra Travis Kalanick, uh, right. is... The founder that, of Uber, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know to what extent he's really the founder, but he, he was their CEO for most okay. of their... Uh, okay. their uh, like He's kind of like known as the figurehead that built it. Um, and his argument is you're essentially lying. So like anytime you lie, you're exhausting yourself because you need to, there's just like too much mental overhead to like keep up with the lie. Hmm. And then you end up becoming just exhausted. So let's say if you're an entrepreneur and you're like exaggerating your metrics and it's like, well, I'm saying that this customer is a customer. They're actually just a POC, a pr proof of concept, but I'm going to put them on my website as a, as a customer and I'll tell other prospective customers that they're a full customer. And then any, every time I talk to that customer, I'm worried that they might have looked on my website and seen that I put the logo. Hmm. And like, and that seems like nothing, but if you just have like this kind of accumulation of, um, of lies, hmm. um, and, and they're not really lies, they're exaggerations, they're yeah. uh, essentially faking it till you make it, you, like, you just get worn down and you just become exhausted and you're incapable of delivering somehow. Hmm. Uh, so that's kind of like the counter argument. And I so liked how you were, I like the word risk that you use because like in a way when you're 18, like you kind of have, like you can get like a lot of leverage by, you know, faking things and like, what's the risk. And then, um, so, so it's kind of like if, when I was 18, like, why would anybody listen to me and at all? So like, if I don't fake it, I'm definitely not going to make it. And then if I do fake it and I get found out, I don't care What's because the what yeah. is there to risk? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it all depends on whether other people have given you a bunch of money and how yeah. far you've gotten in the in the scheme. But it's interesting that Travis K would be saying that. It's, um, I don't remember exactly why he was sort of forced out of Uber, but... It wasn't yeah. for the same reason that Travis of Nicola was forced out. Right. Which was yeah, no, a really bad fake it to make it. <laughs> presumably, you know, he was somebody who had, like he has a kind of personality of somebody who would, uh, you know, push things a little bit too far, probably like, saw the limits of that. Um, so uh, like he had three failed companies for Uber. So Okay. Um, wow. I yeah, know. I mean, obviously there is a kind of, ideal of authenticity and sincerity that seems to compete with this fake it to make it vision. Um, and I think even the defenders of it, like Pascal and James, defenders of fake it to make it, would say, look, it's got to be just in really limited, constrained situations, situations where the option, these are Jamesian terms, the option is forced, like you don't have a choice, you have to do something. 
it's like an exigency. It's really important. And the outcome or the, the object in question just isn't available to ordinary ways of knowing. So it's not like cutting, m making shortcuts where you could find out, but you just don't want to, or you're too lazy. It's in those cases where you just can't know that you can sometimes like go with what looks best and what may be mo most prudential and then try to make it the case. So I think that's really important that there are these, it's not like anything goes in the fake it to make it context. And a lot of these people you're describing are going way yeah. further than many philosophers would have. Yeah, and there's such a huge pull as an entrepreneur because there's no accountability. Right. Um, there's such a huge pull to, to do things. But, but I think uh, uh, like the way Reed would put it, and I think this is might be like more aligned with uh, the the the, pra these, the pragmatists or like Pascal should be like um, so, so the analogy he uses for a startup is um, you know jumping off a cliff and building a plane in midair um, <laughs> yeah and so I like you need to take risks um, not knowing the answer. Um, hmm. Uh, which is different than acting immorally. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you're, like, I don't know if I, I, I'm onto something. That seems right. I mean, except in so far as your other people are jumping off the cliff with you. I mean, there, I think it starts to look like there's a moral question. If you don't have some sense that you're going to be able to build up something that flies. I suppose if it's you by yourself, then that's one thing, but um, the moral considerations usually involve other people. Yeah. But it's interesting to hear you use those metaphors because in academia, there's so little of that. It's the frustrating thing about being an academic. There are a lot of great things, but we don't have that seat of the pants mentality. Typically, it's a very hierarchical, old, you know, ancient institution. Things move slowly. Things don't, the big risks are typically not taken. And so it's fun to sort of peek in, even just talking to you, to the entrepreneurial world and hear about what it's like there. Yeah, it's definitely very, very different. Um, and uh, yeah, startups are a really, like, it's an interesting world. Um, and it's not at all what you would think it is. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, I got uh, that and, from listening to some of your previous podcasts. I got that sense, yeah. Yeah, like it's it's uh, like I think if you're like being actually successful as a startup founder mm -hmm. is you know requires well just like it just requires a lot. It requires getting like everything right. It requires mm -hmm. being and it's, it's just very 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 difficult, mm -hmm. and it requires a lot more thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a way, I think studying philosophy, so actually Chris and Reed have a podcast episode about this, uh, MBA versus philosopher. Um, okay. and I definitely fall on the philosopher side. It's just like, you're better off being a philosopher entrepreneur than an MBA entrepreneur. Um, can you say more? I mean, I love to tell my students these kinds of things. So what you and Reed have these backgrounds in philosophy. Like, how do you feel like that has added to your work in the entrepreneurial world? Yeah, so I think the, so it's like any true insight usually comes from another area of life, hmm. right? So let's say, for me, I, I worked in a political party. So I spent seven years working um, in, in a political party. Hmm. And um, I was very successful at doing that. I, I don't think it was a really good fit for my what I want to do. Um, and I don't think I care that much about politics. But when you're 18, um, you know, it's a really cool opportunity. And yeah. so I spent a lot of time doing that. And so when I observe things that happen in politics um, and, you know, both in Canada, in the U.S. domestically, but also like geopolitically, you can see things that are happening and, see, and then you can see patterns 
and cross-reference those patterns with what's happening in business, hmm. right? So for example, if you ask yourself, like, why is it that the, that Donald Trump has become more successful after becoming, after getting all these lawsuits, like more people are, um, are support him. His supporters love him more and more. The more that he gets all these like attack and has these lawsuits coming mm. after him. Mm. And it's like, how does that actually happen? Like, how does it actually function? Right. And in a way, what it is, it's the, um, it's the kind of like for his supporters, he is not, Donald Trump is not Luke. All right. Donald Trump is like, they are Luke and he is kind of their, their Obi-Wan or their mm. Yoda. Mm. Um, and that's kind of the relationship that they have, right? Mm. And you can see this, so, so you can kind of like peer, or like understand things about business that are actually like fundamental and deep and actually the things that you need to understand, right? So mm. if you build a business and you think that you are Luke, you will fail. And somebody can tell you this story and it'll seem like, oh, this is just bullshit. But then if you can see that in you know, this story that, uh, 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 you know, and in politics, you've seen that work out and because you have an interest in that, right? And it's the same thing saying sports. It's like, so having yeah. like a lot, like a multidisciplinary interests really helps um, to understand the like truly deep, and deep is the same thing as useful, right? Like the surface level tactics don't matter. And, and actually the, the insight that you are ready to accept is always useless. Like the, the insight you need is the insight that's like a couple cycles further than your mind is ready for. Mm -hmm. And having, being able to like see things from other areas of life helps kind of get a few cycles ahead. And then philosophy specifically is just like, it, it, it gives you a lot of frameworks that are like, explicit yeah. and really thought through and, and 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 kind of like ordered out and and explained so it's just a lot like let's say if you did sports you could learn things from sports that you could apply to entrepreneurship of course and, and I, I i did rowing so so i, I do do that yeah. but i found philosophy is a lot more the case because of its explicit nature while let's say politics or sports uh are are less explicit so that's that's i think yeah, why that's it's useful it's right that it's a you know three thousand plus year old discipline, and so the frameworks have have definitely been well thought by some of the strongest minds, and so I can see how at least sometimes that could be a real resource. And it is funny that in I I don't know what Chris would say about this, but I doubt that if you're a finance major or working on financial engineering or you know these various BAs that even Princeton now has. Um, as well as MBAs, you're not getting that kind of multidisciplinary. Correct. Access. Yeah. And so, it's really a problem. Like your people become way too, um, it's a problem with specialization. Like they, it really slows down your speed of learning. Yeah. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons I think why engineers are much better CEOs than you know, MBAs, because uh, you can, so let's say like, I'm also a software developer, like that's my, that was my first job. Yeah. And when I, so let's say if I'm building a sales model, like sales process, I think about it using an engineering, um, you know, analogy. Sure. Um, like I think about it as a system, which, and the kind of analogies I use are from engineering. Mm -hmm. And, that is just so useful. Like, and it's not that, that it's just like having these, like, let's say, so for me, right? Like I can look at what works in politics. I have an interest in that. What works in sports? I have an interest in that. What works in engineering? What are the frameworks? What are the frameworks in philosophy? And then you try to bring all those into business and it becomes totally natural because you just have an interest in that. Hmm. While if you're only focused on business, Maybe it's true that these frameworks exist and somebody's laid them out. So let's say this, kind of like you are, you are not Luke, right? You are um, uh, like you're Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. I mean, in a way that's actually taking things from culture. So it's, it's cross-disciplinary, but 
you know, that is kind of like an insight from a business person that's telling you that. So you yeah. could get this insight, but the, the thing is, as a human, you cannot accept these things. So, so like, if uh, like if you if you're a business, but like, like I'm sure Nancy, she tells us to people, and they mm -hmm. say like, yeah, that sounds right, but they don't understand it. They don't accept it. Hmm. But if they had been able to see it you know, through, you know, different lenses, then they would understand the deep truth and they'd be able to apply it. And you, you in my experience, just because of how deep the feel of philosophy is, yeah. you just have, you know, so many frameworks. And, you know, if you're reading like, you know, so, so the, I, I, like the, the two texts I always refer, like the three texts I always refer to people is the tarantulas from Nietzsche's mm -hmm. Thus Spoke Zarathustra, yeah, uh, the Crito by, which is, you know, well, a Socratic text, uh, so by Plato, really. And right. then um, Schopenhauer on reading. Really? Okay. Uh, those are kind of, like, they're, they're all, like, really short. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and like they're all like totally different, right? Like they think about things totally differently, yeah. And um, they give you like these really useful frameworks for, uh, for for understanding the world. So like Schopenhauer and Socrates are just different, yeah. And you don't have that in business. Like there's not that much diversity in the the ways of thinking. I mean, I think another example. At, like without pandering to the guy who wrote the book too much, but that paper we were talking about reads thing on Adam Smith and the virtues and vices, you know, like thinking of social media as exemplifying certain ancient um, theories of vice was actually mm. fruitful. So what was it like? Facebook well, is pride, LinkedIn is avarice and Zynga yeah. was sloth. I love that. So, so that's actually a really good example. So, yeah. so the reason Reed came up with that is so he trains young VCs, right? Yeah. That's his job. Now he's mostly left Greylock, but um, which is a fund he worked at. But most, like his day job, is primarily training up younger VCs. Yeah. And the mistake young VCs, I mean, they make young VCs suck. But one of the things, big mistakes they make is to think about TAM, total addressable market. So they'll be right. like. You know, healthcare is a big market. And that is just the wrong way of looking at things. It's like 1% of all healthcare, that's huge. And you actually see big VCs who think that, like, like younger VCs who think that way. And it's just totally wrong. But it's unclear why it's wrong. Because it's true that the total market matters. But it's like, why, why is that wrong? Like, and, and what's the right model? And nobody has the right model. It's like, Cam is wrong, but what's right? And then what Reed says, like, like remove yourself from, like, there are no business concepts that are useful here. Like, remove all these business concepts from your mind and think of Cam. Instead of think of Cam, think like how likely it is that a lot of people are going to do this. Hmm. And the way you know that a lot of people are going to do this is because it kind of aligns with one of the uh, deadly sins. And if you have, if it's one of the seven deadly sins, then you know that a lot of people are going to do it. And <laughs> so that's kind of like his counter to yeah. this concept of total market size. Hmm. But you can see how if you're only, if you're an MBA and you, you just only care about business, you would never think that way. And then you would, you wouldn't be able to explain why TAM is wrong and hmm. what is an alternative, alternative framework. So it gives you causal explanations that go way beyond market and sort of basic economic concepts. Yeah, that seems right. Correct. So it's like, and this, it's, this is the actual thing, right? Like, it's not like, hey, how big is this market? You have to say, like, will a lot of people use this? Hmm. That's the actual thing you have to ask yourself. And like, Reed was able to come to this insight by by thinking about the and, and be able to communicate to others by thinking about. Uh, this you know philosophical concept um, yeah, uh, cool. religion slash philosophy of yeah, the yeah. seven deadly sins. That's a really great example, and and I think. Um, but there are a lot of people, as I was saying, uh, the CEO of Shopify is a, a philosophy major, and he right. runs a sort of philosophy book group. 
Um, the top crypto investor uh, is also a philosophy. Uh, well, it is bachelor's and his master's in philosophy. So it's oh, not an unusual who's thing. That? Who is that? Uh, Chris Dixon. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, you mentioned him before. Yeah, I mean, it's philosophy majors all over the place. Stephen Colbert was a philosophy major. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's let you get, get on with your day. I, you're, yeah. you're very uh, uh, you know, in demand. People people pay uh, 50K a year to, uh, to, to talk to you. So. <laughs> Just um, to talk to me. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, to talk to your TAs. So, uh, right, so exactly. You're yeah. more valuable than that. So, yeah, so um, you try to talk to the students directly. But so, thank Andrew, you so thank much. you so much. Yeah. yeah. And, and to everyone listening, thank you for uh, the time. Uh, you know, I think the easiest place to find Andrew is chignell.net, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. It was really fun to talk to you.